Section 1 of History of the New York Times, 1851 to 1921. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Joanne Turner. History of the New York Times, 1851 to 1921 by Elmer Holmes Davis. Part 1. Chapter 1. Beginnings of the Times, 1851-1859. to 1859. Part 1. In a sense, the New York Times is the result of an accident, or of a sequence of accidents. Sooner or later, Henry J. Raymond and George Jones would have become partners in the production of a newspaper, and wherever or whatever that newspaper might have been, its character would have been fixed by the common ideals which these men held, as its prosperity would have been ensured by their unusually fortunate combination of talents. But it was only a chance that this Raymond Jones newspaper, whose early years established the standard and the character which the Times strives to maintain today, was the New York Times and not the Albany Evening Journal and it took more accidents to bring Raymond and Jones together in 1851. The acquaintance and friendship of the two men who directed the Times for the first four decades of its history began in the early 40s in the office of the New York Tribune. Jones, a native of Vermont, had come to New York and gone into business, and had been invited by Horace Greeley to become his partner in the establishment of the Tribune in 1841. Whether from a failure to realize the wider field for newspaper enterprise which was opening in New York, or from a well-grounded distrust of Greeley's business judgment, Jones refused. But he did take a place in the Tribune business office, and there not only acquired a thorough familiarity with what may be called the elementary system of a newspaper, but formed a friendship with Raymond, who was Greeley's principal editorial assistant. Presently, Raymond went over to the Courier and Inquirer, then edited by General James Watson Webb, and Jones later moved to Albany, where he engaged in the business of redeeming banknotes. In those days, when almost anybody could start a bank and issue paper money, which might or might not have a solid reserve behind it, this was a somewhat hazardous occupation, but Jones made it profitable. His business ability commended itself to Thurlow Weed, who had become acquainted with Raymond both as a newspaper man and as a rising young Whig politician. In 1848, Weed wanted to get out of the Albany Evening Journal and offered to sell it to the two friends. Raymond and Jones were willing but one of Weed's partners would not let go, so the enterprise came to nothing. But it had shown Raymond and Jones that they were not alone in thinking that they could get out a pretty good newspaper. For the moment, Raymond's chief attention was diverted to politics. He was elected to the Assembly in 1849 and became its speaker two years later. But the idea of a Raymond Jones newspaper never died thereafter. In 1850, General Webb went to Europe and left Raymond in temporary charge of the Courier and Inquirer. Raymond not only failed to use his political influence to promote Webb's brief senatorial boom, but incurred his chief's disfavor by speaking out some plain truths on the slavery question in connection with the compromise proposals of that year. Raymond was not then, and never was, till well along in the Civil War, an abolitionist. But he did not think that the more urgent question of the slave power in politics could be cured by ignoring it or by tame surrender. His independence got him into Webb's bad graces, and when Raymond went to Albany for the legislative session that winter, he was eager to get away from Webb and start out for himself. Jones was somewhat more reluctant to give up a business which he had made profitable, but it happened that a bill was then before the legislature which proposed to regulate the rate of banknote redemption so severely 
that it would make the business entirely too hazardous for men of integrity. One day, early in 1851, Jones and Raymond were walking across the Hudson on the ice when Jones observed that he had heard that the Tribune had made a profit of $60,000, in those days an enormous sum in the past year. This renewed Raymond's enthusiasm, and before they reached the other shore, he had obtained Jones' promise to join him, if the redemption bill passed, in the establishment of a new daily in New York. The bill did pass. Jones closed up his business, and he and his business associate, E.B. Wesley, prepared to put their money, with Raymond's experience, into the new venture. But if this series of accidents led directly to the establishment of the Times, it is nevertheless true that, essentially, the paper was brought into being to fill a keenly felt want in the New York journalism of the day. The conditions which made possible the prosperity of the times in the 50s were, in general, the conditions which opened the way for the spectacularly successful reconstruction of the times in the 90s. In each case, New York newspapers, numerous and varied as they were, had nonetheless left vacant a large and profitable part of the newspaper field and in each case the demand for a certain kind of paper, a paper characterized under Raymond, as under Ox, by the somewhat unpretentious but still popular qualities of moderation and decency, created the supply. In the 50s, as in the 90s, there were many newspaper readers in New York who wanted a paper which, first of all, gave the news, but which was not distorted by eccentricities of a personal editorial attitude or tainted by excessive attention to folly, immorality, and crime. The character which Raymond gave to the times, excellence in news service, avoidance of fantastic extremes in editorial opinion, and a general sobriety in manner, is the character which the times has retained ever since, and which those now engaged in producing the paper hope it still retains. There was a field for a sane and sensible newspaper in New York in 1851. The city had not yet recovered from its surprise at finding itself a great metropolis with more than half a million people, already far beyond its old rivals of the Atlantic seaboard and obviously destined to still greater growth in the future. It was spreading rapidly, sprawlingly, with little attention to the manner of its extension. Its government was execrable, its civic beauties few and well concealed, its spirit still affected by the old, small-town tradition. But it was growing. It was attracting new men by the thousands, ambitious young men like Raymond from upstate, like Jones and others, many others, from New England. Those men were beginning the work of making New York, to which their most active and able successors of more recent times have done little more than add a few embellishments. Both the old spirit and the new were reflected in the newspapers of New York. There still survived some excellent examples of the type of newspaper which had prevailed in the earlier decades of the century. The so-called blanket sheets, literally big enough to be slept under, especially by those who had tried to read them. They were massive, expensive, and dull, dignified if not respectable, content with a small circulation among gentlemen who had plenty of time, if not much inclination, for reading, and were willing enough to get around to this morning's news about the middle of next week. The new era began with the establishment of the Sun in 1833, a paper which, for the first time in America, discovered the rudimentary literacy of the lower classes. The Sun of 1833, or even of 1851, was nothing like the Sun as made famous by Dana long afterward. It was filled for the most part with trivialities, and according to Augustus Maverick, Raymond's biographer, was read in 1851 chiefly by, quote, 
domestics in quest of employment, and cartmen dozing at street corners in waiting for a job, unquote. But it had opened up a new field, and this field was entered two years later by a much more interesting and much better newspaper, James Gordon Bennett's Herald. Bennett was the inventor of almost everything, good and bad, in modern journalism. He was the first editor who gave his chief attention to the collection of news, and before long his competition had compelled all newspapers, which made any pretension to influence, to undertake unheard-of expenditures, and to compete with him in the utilization of the railroad, the steamship, the telegraph, and other new inventions just coming into use. In his salutary to the public, he disclaimed, among other things, all principle, as it is called. His enemies and professional rivals, in the early days of the Herald the two terms were synonymous, would have said that he had merely rejected all good principles. Tammany Hall and slavery usually found the Herald on their side. Moreover, Bennett invented yellow journalism. He discovered and encouraged the popular taste for vicarious vice and crime, and before long, respectable citizens who would have liked to read the Herald for the news felt constrained to exclude it from their homes for fear of its effect on the somewhat sensitive morals of the Victorian family. It must be admitted that this obscene Herald, which was regarded with such horror in the middle of the 19th century, was not so very terrible, judged by the more elastic standards of our time. Every page of every issue bears the mark of Bennett's powerful and eccentric talent, and it undoubtedly did give more space to news of crime and human error than its rivals, but it respected certain reticences which had passed into history before many of the Night City editors of 1921 were born. However, moral standards were more exigent in those days, and Bennett's frank and premature cynicism probably contributed to the ill repute of his paper. In the 40s, good principles were exemplified by few, but professed by everybody but Bennett. And it was the shrinking of virtuous citizens from the loathsome newspaper whose editor dared to talk as most people acted that opened the way for Greeley's success with the Tribune. When Greeley established the Tribune in 1841, Bennett had things pretty much his own way. Of the heavier and more conservative sheets, the Courier Inquirer was kept in the foreground by the aggressive and pugnacious personality of James Watson Webb, but none of these papers could vie with Bennett in popularity or financial success. The Sun had long since been beaten in its own field and no one then foresaw its ultimate revenge in that recent and curious transaction wherein the Herald swallowed the sun and emerged from the process so exactly like the sun as to furnish perhaps the best exemplification in history of the proverb, Man ist was man ist. But Greeley soon gave Bennett real competition. In the first place, the Sun and the Herald leaned toward the Democrats, and Greeley first came forward to offer a cheap newspaper to the Whigs. Moreover, the Tribune, as a newspaper, was about as good as the Herald, and it carefully avoided all the Herald's offenses against the taste of the time. Yet the Tribune itself soon incurred moral disapproval because of Greeley's advocacy of the principles of foyeristic socialism. The chief characteristic of the Tribune under Greeley was an aggressive and even ostentatious purity. Immoral and degrading police reports, and any notices of the existence of the theater, whether in news or advertising, were at first scrupulously excluded. Greeley appealed to man as he likes to pretend to be. Bennett, to man as he is, occasionally compelled to admit he really is. Greeley promoted temperance with a zeal equaled only by that other eminent moralist of the time, P.T. Barnum, 
and professed an intention to make the Tribune, though a penny paper, a welcome visitor at the family fireside. Heads of families soon found it rather startling that a paper with such an ambition was becoming the vehicle of doctrines whose logical application would make the family obsolete. Greeley's socialism was no doubt sincere. He seems to have been the type of man who was so sincere in everything he did as to make the impartial observer somewhat more tolerant of judicious hypocrisy. And certainly his observation of the Panic of 1837 and of the struggles between Tammany and the local Whig machine for the control of the city government might have justified him in concluding that no political and economic organization of society could be much worse than that which actually obtained. Foyerism was popular. Brook Farm, the Oneida community, New Harmony, and hundreds of less known and less successful communistic experiments were being attempted in various parts of the country. Greeley's advocacy of the reorganization of society on the basis of the social phalanx was not hampered by any consideration of the difficulty of fitting a metropolitan newspaper with a large circulation into a state of phalangites. But doubtless he was taking only one step at a time and saw no reason for crossing this bridge before he came to it. In the meantime, Albert Brisbane, father of the better-known Arthur Brisbane and an eminent apostle of what Mr. Wells would doubtless call the Neanderthal type of socialism, was allowed the run of the Tribune and enjoyed the esteem of its editors. Greeley, to be sure, was no more than what would now be called a parlor Bolshevik, but it was only natural that his professional and commercial rivals in that acrimonious age should suspect him of a willingness to acquiesce in the logical extension of his doctrines to other parts of the house. Despite his protests and denials, it suited the other newspapers of the city to regard him as the advocate of free love, and the controversy found fullest expression in the autumn of 1846 in an editorial warfare between Greeley and his old employee Raymond, then on the Courier and Inquirer. A dozen or so long articles were written on each side, and Raymond succeeded in proving to the entire satisfaction of everybody who agreed with him, that the doctrines advocated by the Tribune not only would be destructive of property right, family affection, and political association, but were contrary to the teachings of revealed religion, an assertion which he evidently regarded as crushing and which, in 1846, undoubtedly was. The Tribune prospered in spite of these handicaps, but there were a great many people who wanted the news as the Tribune printed it without the sensational matter to be found in the Herald, and equally without the questionable and subversive doctrines which might be seen lurking beneath the chest-thumping morality of the Tribune's editorial page. To its enthusiasm for socialism, moreover, the Tribune added a vigorous propaganda for Irish freedom, and the growing power of the Irish element in Tammany Hall had already aroused a certain reluctance, readily intelligible today, to allow New York City to be used as an overseas base for this hardy perennial conflict. To this public, Raymond and Jones decided to appeal, not only because it was there, and waiting for a paper suited to its taste, but also because its taste happened to be the taste of Raymond and Jones. Raymond went to Europe for a vacation in the summer of 1851, after drawing up with Jones and Wesley the plans for the new paper. His own expression in a letter to his brother, dated from London in June 1851, is modest enough. Quote, Two gentlemen in Albany proposed to start a new paper in New York early in September, and I shall probably edit it. Unquote. This was undoubtedly the way it seemed to Raymond at the time. 
but it was Raymond's personality that made the paper's character at the outset, and in the Jubilee Supplement of the Times issued in 1901, it was set down as the measured judgment of the editors of the paper that, quote, the Times has always been at its best when its conduct approached most nearly to his ideal of a daily newspaper, unquote. After Raymond's death, circumstances compelled Jones to discover and display for a time his own very great talent as supervisor of the editorial policy of the Times. But for the 18 years from its establishment to Raymond's death, it was known to the country as Raymond's newspaper. Its virtues were largely his. Its weakness was chiefly due to his one uncontrollable defect, an addiction to politics. Raymond was born on a farm near Lima, New York in 1820 and graduated from the University of Vermont in 1840. For a few months thereafter, he supported himself in New York as a freelance newspaperman, but was about to give it up in despair and become a schoolteacher in North Carolina when Greeley, for whom he had done some writing on space, offered him a salary of $8 a week. It was Greeley who, in later years, when Raymond was a rival editor, bestowed on him the title of The Little Villain, a mild enough epithet according to the standards of journalistic courtesy in the 50s, but Greeley, in his more moderate moments, liked Raymond and said that a more generally efficient journalist I never saw, and that Raymond was the only man who ever worked for him whom he had had to reprove for working too hard. After three years with Greeley, Raymond went over to the Courier and Inquirer, and remained with that paper till plans had been made for the establishment of the Times. By that time, though only thirty-one, he was one of the best-known and ablest newspapermen in New York. He was a small man, but pugnacious, as editors had to be in those days. Though it was Raymond's fortune to begin his independent career after the close of the period when editors went about in momentary expectation, or meditation, of personal violence, he had occasion more than once to display not only moral but physical courage in defense of his principles. As a reporter and editorial writer, he was remarkably gifted. His writing was rapid, his style clear, a rarer virtue in those times. His copy was legible. A feat recorded by his biographer, Maverick, who says he was an eyewitness, is here cited without comment. On the day of Daniel Webster's death, Raymond wrote, in the late afternoon and early evening, sixteen columns of the obituary in long hand and without the aid of such material as a newspaper morgue now furnishes. In his views on public questions, Raymond was, if anything, too well balanced. He often lamented a habit of mind which inclined him to see both sides in any dispute. This may have hampered him as a politician, but on the whole it probably did the Times more good than harm. There were plenty of infuriated and vituperant newspapers in those days, and the success of the Times in the fifties showed that a considerable part of the public approved a measure of temperance in opinions on public affairs. To a certain extent, however, Raymond was really ahead of the time. His attitude toward the problems which led to and arose out of the Civil War, for example, is in almost every detail that which is approved by the judgment of history, in so far as that judgment can ever be set down with certainty. He was a Whig in the early fifties, but not a bigoted Whig. He was not an abolitionist, but he believed that the domination of the federal government by the slave states in the interest of slavery, the domination of a majority by a minority, must be ended. In the middle of the decade, he became a free soil man and then one of the founders of the Republican Party. During the war, he was a bitter ender, 
even in the dark days when better advertised patriots were willing to accept a peace without victory. But when the end was reached, Raymond did his best to remove the bitterness. It would have been infinitely better for the whole country if Raymond, and not Thaddeus Stevens, had been allowed to lay down the Reconstruction policy. And though Raymond went astray in thinking for a time that Andrew Johnson was all that a man in his position with his enemies ought to have been, the soundness of the principles which Raymond held, and which Johnson rather spasmodically tried to apply, has been demonstrated by the subsequent course of history. There can be no doubt, however, that Raymond's preoccupation with politics distracted much of his attention from the times, and the paper suffered heavily, though not for long, from his unpopularity in the early days of Reconstruction. In the 50s, it was not yet realized that the editor of a successful New York paper was a bigger man than the Speaker of the Assembly or even the Lieutenant Governor. Yet it was characteristic of Raymond that when some of his friends wanted to put him up for governor in 1856, he refused, for fear his aggressive record as a Whig might stand in the way of the rapprochement of Free Soil Whigs and Free Soil Democrats in the new Republican Party. Raymond has perhaps too hastily been called a political follower of Thurlow Weed and William H. Seward and some writers have even regarded Weed as a sort of man behind the throne on the times, it is a curious foible of a certain type of mind that it is unable to imagine a newspaper editor as one who may, on some public questions, honestly have the same view as that held by other persons. Unless he is absolutely unique and eccentric in his political opinions, he is presumed by certain critics to be bought or otherwise controlled by the people who agree with him. Raymond did indeed have a great respect for Weed's political judgment, a general agreement with Weed's political views, and a friendly relation with Weed himself. In his early political career, he was in a sense a follower of Weed, just as he was a follower of Seward in 1860 to the extent of supporting him for the presidential nomination. But on many matters he disagreed with these gentlemen, and while their relative rank in political affairs was considerably higher than his in the fifties, Raymond's vigorous support of Lincoln gave him a personal influence during the Civil War that was due to Raymond alone. In 1864, as chairman of the Republican National Committee, he could hardly be described as a follower of anybody but Lincoln, who fully recognized his immense value in that year to the party and the nation. Weed often and naturally came into the Times office to talk politics with Raymond, and no doubt to offer occasional thoughts on political journalism, but Raymond knew a good deal about politics and a good deal more about journalism and would have known it if he had never seen Weed in his life. For a short time just after the Civil War, Weed was a contributor of political articles to the paper, but there seems to be no foundation for the theory that he was ever its dominating influence or ever tried to be. Raymond was not so inhuman as to have no friends or so original as to have no political associates but he, and he alone, was editor of the Times. On August 5, 1851, the association which was to publish the new paper was formed under the name of Raymond Jones & Company. In August 1860, the name was changed to H. J. Raymond & Company, and in July 1871, after Raymond's heirs had sold out their holdings, to the New York Times. The stock was divided into a hundred shares, the nominal par value of which seems to have been set by tacit agreement at $1,000. Raymond received 20 shares as an equivalent for his editorial ability. Jones and Wesley had 40 shares each as an equivalent for their capital and business ability, 
but the actual cash investment then made was only $40,000, each man putting up half. When the paper was established in the following month, the cash investment seems to have totaled $69,000. Jones and Wesley had already found it necessary to increase their own investment and to give up some of the stock which was to have been an equivalent for their business ability in return for cash. At the outset, Jones and Wesley held 25 shares each. J.B. Plum, Daniel B. St. John, and Francis B. Ruggles, five shares each, and E.B. Morgan and Christopher Morgan, two shares each. The Morgan interest, small as it was, has a considerable place in the time's history, for at a later crisis in the affairs of the paper, during the fight against Tweed, E.B. Morgan came in and bought the stock of the Raymond estate, thereby giving Jones invaluable security in his struggle with Tammany. Raymond chose for the new paper the name of the New York Daily Times, which had been born in the 30s by a publication so short-lived that for all practical purposes the name was as good as new. A prospectus was already in circulation and had been published as an advertisement in the other dailies of the city. On the whole, and inevitably, the prospectus contained blameless generalities. The Times was going to include all that was good in both conservatism and radicalism, while avoiding the defects of either. It announced in firm tones its belief in the doctrines of Christianity and Republicanism, which nobody in the United States except the Indians would in that day have denied, and it declared the intention of the publishers, quote, to make the Times at once the best and the cheapest daily family newspaper in the United States, unquote. But along with these routine announcements, there were one or two which meant something. The Times, quote, is not established for the advancement of any party, sect, or person, unquote. Quote, it will be under the editorial management and control of Henry J. Raymond, and while it will maintain firmly and zealously those principles which he may deem essential to the public good and which are held by the great Whig Party of the United States more nearly than by any other political organization, its columns will be free from bigoted devotion to narrow interests, unquote. For a party politician and officeholder to admit that his party could conceivably fall short of perfection was a novelty in the 50s. Moreover, quote, while it will assert and exercise the right freely to discuss every subject of public interest, it will not countenance any improper interference on the part of the people of any locality with the institutions or even the prejudices of another, unquote. There was a reason for this. During the summer, there had been many rumors about the new paper, and the motive of its founders was set down as almost everything but what it really was, to establish a new paper that would publish, as a later motto of the Times put it, all the news that's fit to print, a phrase which exactly expresses the intentions of Raymond and Jones. It suited Raymond's political and journalistic enemies to accuse him of being an abolitionist, and the apprehensive rivals of the new paper tried to discredit it by asserting in advance that it was going to further the doctrine of abolition, or the presidential candidacy of General Scott, or the presidential candidacy of some other dignitary, or anything else that might seem likely to bring it into disrepute. The motive of this was clear enough even at the time, for the established newspapers made the same efforts to hamper the circulation of the Times that had been tried successively on the Sun, the Herald, and the Tribune, and with no more effect. New York was growing so fast that the extraordinary prosperity which attended the times almost from the outset brought no real injury to any of its important rivals. For years thereafter, they all grew and prospered together. 
these attacks had given the paper a good deal of free advertising, which was soon turned to good account. Raymond had collected the nucleus of an excellent staff, several reporters and editors, and a dozen employees of the mechanical departments left the Tribune in a body to come over to the new paper. And despite the unreadiness of the building at 113 Nassau Street, which had been rented as the first home of the paper, it appeared eventually only two days later than the date promised in the prospectus. Quote, on the night of the 17th of September, 1851, unquote, says Maverick, Quote, the first number of the Times was made up in open lofts, destitute of windows, gas, speaking tubes, dumb waiters, and general conveniences. All was raw and dismal. The writer remembers sitting by the open window at midnight, looking through the dim distance at Raymond's first lieutenant, who was diligently writing brevier, editorial copy so called from the name of the type in which it was set at a rickety table at the end of the barren garret, his only light a flaring candle held upright by three nails in a block of wood. At the city editor and the newsman, and the reporters all eagerly scratching pens over paper, their countenances half-lighted, half-shaded by other candles. At Raymond, writing rapidly and calmly, as he always wrote, but under similar disadvantages. Unquote. The first number of the Times on the streets the following morning contained an editorial article, by Raymond, of course, headed, A Word About Ourselves, and beginning with the declaration, We publish today the first number of the New York Daily Times, and we intend to issue it every morning, Sundays accepted, for an indefinite number of years to come. Unquote. This salutary contained a promise which was soon justified by performance. Quote, we do not mean to write as if we were in a passion, unless that shall really be the case, and we shall make it a point to get into a passion as rarely as possible. There are very few things in this world which it is worthwhile to get angry about, and they are just the things that anger will not improve. Unquote. There was rather more anger than was needful in most of the New York papers of that period, especially in their editorial controversies with each other. Yet it is pleasant to record that editorial ethics in this city have shown a steady improvement. In the earlier decades of the 19th century, editors were compelled by public opinion to back up their tirades against each other by appearances on the field of honor. By the time of Greeley and Bennett, this practice, which made an already hazardous occupation somewhat too troublesome for comfort, was dying out, and the ethics of the period permitted rival editors to fight out their quarrels with walking sticks or horsewhips when they met on Broadway, instead of taking to pistols and the Weehawken Ferry. And in 1851, even horsewhipping was beginning to go out of fashion. No doubt an argument could be made out for this custom in theory, but as a practical measure, it did not seem to moderate editorial passions, though not everybody was as unconcerned as Bennett, who published the account of one of his own unfortunate personal encounters in the Herald under the heading, Horse Whipped Again. By 1851, however, the traffic on Broadway had become so heavy that it was impossible to hold it up while rival newspaper proprietors belabored each other with malacca sticks, and emotion had to be expressed on the editorial page. There, to be sure, it flourished with intensity. Vile wretch, profligate scoundrel, and infamous reprobate were terms commonly employed as designations of professional colleagues and for decades thereafter the newspapers gave a good deal more editorial attention to each other's misfortunes and shortcomings than the relative importance of the topic deserved. Today, aside from one or two publications whose ethical standards are paleolithic in other respects as well, the newspapers of New York 
usually have sufficient self-restraint to conceal their opinions of each other and devote such editorial reference as they make to criticisms of specific views of a contemporary rather than to animadversions on its editor's personal appearance and moral character. No doubt this mollification of manners is all for the best, but veteran editorial writers complain that it has taken a good deal of the fierce joy out of the newspaper business. The Times was by no means wholly free from controversies with its rivals, but except in one or two instances it did not carry this practice so far as was the custom, and thereby gave a pleasing instance to New York newspaper readers of the possibility of filling up a newspaper without recourse to the material of personal quarrels. Raymond was only once challenged to fight a duel by an indignant Irish patriot, and a little diplomacy got him honorably out of that. This paper, which was produced under the difficult conditions described by Maverick, consisted of four pages of six columns each. The page was about a third shorter and a third narrower than a page of today's times. There were morning and evening editions, the latter published at one and three o'clock in the afternoon, but there was only one times. Neither the office files nor the memory of the oldest living members of the staff furnish much information about these evening editions, but apparently they contained merely the news arriving after the paper went to press at midnight, with the editorial, advertising, and other features persisting in all editions. The evening editions, in other words, took the place of, and in time were supplanted by, the second, third, and later editions, which the improvement of newspaper mechanics presently made it possible to issue before daylight. There was also in the beginning and for years thereafter a weekly family times. Every daily paper had to have a weekly in those days for circulation on the farm, and in the case of the Tribune, at least the weekly was largely responsible for Greeley's great influence. But with the extension of railroads, it eventually became possible to get the daily paper circulated over a much larger part of the country than was possible in 1851. And after a long and respectable career, the weekly edition of the Times was finally discontinued in the late 70s. A semi-weekly Times, chiefly for rural readers, lasted some years longer. There was besides, in the early days, a Times for California, put together whenever a mail boat happened to be sailing for San Francisco, and a campaign Times issued in presidential years. The Times for California passed away with the rise of the California press, and the campaign edition, which was a weekly, died out for the same reason as the weekly Family Times. From the beginning, the Times was a good newspaper. The first page of the first number is a good specimen of the art of newspaper making as understood in 1851. In the first column, under the masthead containing the terms of subscription and so on, is the heading, The News from Europe. Single column headlines were the invariable rule then, of course, as they were until a much later period, and the descriptive headline had not yet been invented. The News from Europe is preceded by a short summary, the opening lines of which illustrate the method of obtaining foreign news in that day. Quote, the Royal Mail steamer Europa arrived at Boston yesterday at about six o'clock. Her mails were sent on by the New Haven Railroad train, which left at nine o'clock, and reached this city at an early hour last evening. By this arrival, we have received our regular English and French files with correspondence, circulars, etc., to Saturday, September 6th, the Europa's day of sailing. The news by this arrival has considerable interest, although it is not of startling importance." Unquote. Then follows a brief summary of the news, and after that the news itself under the headings Great Britain, France, etc., most of it taken from the London papers. 
There are some three and a half columns of European news, then a column about a fugitive slave riot at Lancaster, Pennsylvania. The rest of the page is filled with brief local items, ending with perhaps a quarter of a column from Brooklyn. At the head of the local news is this paragraph, quote, The weather was the theme upon which we hinged an item for our morning edition, but we have been forced to forego the infliction of it upon the public by the proceedings of the Boston Jubilee, which our special correspondent has forwarded us. Never mind, the president cannot always be lionizing through the country, and as soon as he returns home, we shall endeavor to do this important subject full justice." Unquote. Other local items include the announcement that the fountain in Washington Square gets on toward completion with moderate speed, and reports of the appearance of the bloomer costume in Greenwich Village. Two or three fires are chronicled, and under the heading of false alarm, the Times announces, quote, The hall bell rang an alarm at nine o'clock last evening for the 6th District, but our item gatherer failed to discover the first spark of a fire, unquote. It must be recorded with regret that the Herald's item gatherer did find that fire, but this did not establish a precedent. The Times merit soon forced its way to recognition, and the circulation soon began to approach that of the Herald and the Tribune. Reviewing the first year of the paper on September 18, 1852, Raymond said that it has been immeasurably more successful in all respects than any newspaper of a similar character ever before published in the United States. So far as public esteem was concerned, that was unquestionably true. But if Raymond had stopped to consult Jones and Wesley, he might have said, in all respects but one. The Times was not yet paying its way. $50,000 had been spent at the outset for mechanical equipment. Newsprint paper was then as now the heaviest drain on the Treasury, though as paper it was a good deal better in those days. Of the Times' first-year expense, more than half, $40,000, was spent for paper, $25,000 for the wages of the mechanical and business departments, $13,000 on correspondents, editors, and reporters. The circulation at the end of the year was more than 26000 a figure highly creditable in the circumstances, but the small size of the paper restricted the space available for advertising. Rates were accordingly high, and advertisers saw no reason for paying extra to appear in the Times, when they could reach as many readers for less money in the Tribune, Sun, or Herald. The stipulations of the Articles of Incorporation as to the division of profits were, so far, a mere exercise in fantasy. Raymond, as editor of the paper, received a salary of $2,500 a year. Jones and Wesley had had only the privilege of putting in more money. But with the second year, the Times took the plunge and doubled its size. It also doubled the price, going up to two cents a copy, and the circulation at once shrank from 26,000 to 18,000. But the extra pages gave room not only for more advertising, but for more news, and before long, the loss in circulation had been more than made up. In 1857, the Times claimed a circulation of 40,000. Jones had managed the business during the first year, but then was constrained to take a trip to Europe on account of his health. Wesley had charge of the business office for some time thereafter, but in 1853, Fletcher Harper Jr. was installed as publisher, having purchased some of Jones's and some of Wesley's stock. Harper, it seems, did not get along with the other partners and in 1856 he sold out to them. By that time the paper was prospering. It appeared in some litigation in connection with this sale that the dividends were $20,000 a year, and Jones and Wesley paid $1,666 a share for Harper's stock, the par value of a share being $1,000. Wesley sold out his interest in September 1860 
to Raymond and Leonard W. Jerome, the latter of whom served as consulting director until 1870. After Harper's departure, however, Jones had resumed the management of the business office, and the prosperity thus early established continued unbroken under his direction for more than a quarter of a century. The Times's reputation for balance was almost upset only three months after its establishment, when Louis Kashut came to New York to find in America, if he could, material aid for the renewal of the Hungarian struggle against Austria. Magyar Americans of today may be surprised to learn that, in 1851, the Times was the principal champion in America of the Magyar cause, but the Hungary of 1849 was not the Hungary of 1914. Raymond's enthusiasm over Kashut, whose reception everywhere in America was remarkably favorable and whose progress excited almost as much public interest as the movements of Joffrey in 1917, was unquestionably genuine and sprang from a love for the principles of liberty and nationalism, for which Hungary had lately fought so gallantly. Also, it must be admitted, the arrival of Kashut was the first big local news story after the foundation of the Times, and it was necessary to show New York what the new paper could do. As a result, readers of the Times often found that of their 24 columns of news and advertising, three or four would be devoted to a speech by Kashut, sometimes with the postscript, Remainder Tomorrow, and another column or so to an account of his doings. Nevertheless, the virtual adoption of Kashut and Hungary by the Times was probably a good thing for the paper. Kashut himself, after his return to Europe, acted for a time as London correspondent, and during his stay here, Raymond was enabled to defend him, a grateful labor it must have been too, against James Watson Webb, whose newspaper had taken on itself the function of advocate of the Habsburgs and Romanovs. The conflict between the two came to a head at a dinner given by the city to Kashut on December 11, 1851, where Raymond had been appointed to respond to the toast, quote, The press, the organized voice of freedom, it whispers hope to the oppressed and thunders defiance at the tyrant, unquote. As Raymond rose to respond to the toast and express the sentiment of the company, Webb also rose of his own accord. From the editorial attitude of his paper, it was clear that he was going to whisper hope to the tyrant, and thundered defiance at the oppressed. There was a good deal of confusion, and Webb was finally suppressed by the police. Raymond delivered his speech and then entreated the audience to hear Webb on the other side. But Webb's remarks were drowned by hisses and hoots, and he was compelled to save them up and print them in his paper next day. On another occasion in that first year, Raymond's aggressive personality brought himself and his paper into prominence. The Whig National Convention met at Baltimore in June 1852. Like the national conventions of both parties for years past, it was dominated by a vigorous and truculent group of Southern leaders who were determined that neither the platform nor the candidate should be suspected of hostility to the extension of the peculiar institution. Fillmore was generally favored by the Southern delegates, General Winfield Scott by the Northern, with a little group of willful men sticking to Daniel Webster. The Southerners had their way in every detail of organization and in the writing of the platform, but the Northern leaders expected that their complacence in this respect would be met by Southern acceptance of Scott's candidacy. Raymond, who was present as the chief correspondent of the Times, mentioned this expectation in a dispatch to the paper during the balloting, and added, If Scott is not nominated, they will charge breach of faith on the South. This was promptly telegraphed back to James Watson Webb from his paper in New York, and Webb at once gave the dispatch, which had somewhat misrepresented Raymond's language, 
to some of the Southern leaders. The balloting for a candidate was interrupted on the last day by a demand for the expulsion of Raymond from the convention as the author of an infamous and false attack on the integrity of the delegates. For Raymond was by this time a delegate, having been chosen by the New York representatives to take the place of a man who had gone home. At the time, this was represented as a mere accident, but it appears to have been done with intent. Some of the northern leaders were disgusted and ashamed at their continual humiliations at the hands of the southern fire-eaters, and, knowing Raymond as a brilliant orator of unquestioned courage, they had told a delegate from Oswego to go home and give his seat to Raymond. The offending dispatch and the intrusive web were consequently more or less accidental provocatives of a fight already arranged, to which both sides were looking forward, the Southerners with confidence, the New Yorkers with trepidation. Raymond's speeches on this occasion were a good example of his manner. At the beginning they were mild, conciliatory, almost evasive. He disclaimed any intention to charge a bargain between North and South. He had merely expressed his own opinion. But then he exploded into a declaration that he would assert and continue to assert his opinion that if the South did not meet the North halfway, its delegates would be justly open to a charge of a breach of faith, and he, Raymond, would charge them with it here and everywhere. Then he turned on one cobble of Florida, a veteran bravo of the debating platform, who had volunteered to put the abolitionist in his place. In a moment, Raymond had Cobble indignantly declaring to the chairman, Sir, I cannot, I shall not submit to language of that kind. Raymond replied, Permit me to tell the gentleman from Florida that when he puts words into my mouth which I have not used for the purpose of founding an accusation upon me, he will submit to whatever language I may see fit to use in repelling his aspersions. It was the first time in many years that a northerner had dared to use such language towards a representative of the southern oligarchy. According to southerners present, this speech not only annihilated Kabul at the convention, but he never got rid of its damaging effects when he got home and a writer, evidently an eyewitness, who gave an account of the episode in the Albany Evening Journal after Raymond's death, observed, quote, From that hour the Whig party assumed a new character, and its representatives, with a few disgraceful exceptions, a bolder attitude. Mr. Raymond's clarion voice on that memorable occasion sounded the opening notes in the death knell of slavery. Unquote. This incident deserves some notice for the reason that in those early years, Raymond's career was so largely identical with the history of the times, but it was not altogether so. In 1854, the Kansas-Nebraska Act had begun to split both parties at the North and was preparing the way for the great organization which carried Lincoln to the White House only six years later. Raymond was nominated for lieutenant governor by the Whig State Convention in 1854, to the great disgust of Greeley, who had wanted the office. But he had already been present as a delegate at an anti-Nebraska convention, which accepted the regular nominations that had been forced largely by its threat of secession. The Whigs carried the state by a few hundred votes, and Raymond ran a few hundred more ahead of the gubernatorial candidate. But the editorial attitude of the Times was reserved during the campaign, and it certainly was never used to promote its editor's political fortunes. Two years later, Raymond's friends wanted him to become a candidate for governor, but, as already related, he refused. Whigs and Democrats were uniting in the organization of a new party to prevent the further extension of slavery, and Raymond did not want his personality or any recollection of old animosities 
either between parties or among Whigs, to stand in the way of that movement. The Republican Party, as a national organization, had been established at an informal convention held at Pittsburgh in February 1856, a convention which gave the call for the Philadelphia Convention in June that nominated Fremont. Raymond was at Pittsburgh and wrote the long confession of faith on which the Republican Party was established, an able and convincing document which showed no sympathy with the abolitionists, but did express the determination of moderate Northerners to end the domination of public life by Southern terrorism. This declaration, some 10,000 words in length, was telegraphed from Pittsburgh and published in the Times. But there was little in the paper about the doings of the Pittsburgh Convention and no editorial comment till long after Raymond's return. In the campaign of 1856, the Times and Raymond took a prominent part, and from that time on, for 28 years, the Times stood in the front rank of the Republican journalism of the country. But whatever neglect the institution might have been able to charge against its editor when he strayed aside into politics, it could never have accused him of making the paper an instrument of propaganda or a means to personal advancement. Newspaper mechanics was an infant art in the 50s, and the papers of those days, of course, differed greatly in contents and makeup from those of today. Whether all the changes have been for the better or not is to be doubted. Considering the conditions, Times in the 50s was an excellent newspaper. So, for that matter, were the Herald and the Tribune. The Telegraph was coming into more and more general use, but still was something of a novelty, and an expensive novelty. The latest by Telegraph was a heading apt to stand over a column or two of brief and heterogeneous items from everywhere, with most of the details coming along later by mail. Local news was written much more in the editorial manner than is common today. If a reporter was writing about a spade, he called it a spade, instead of describing it generally as an agricultural implement or referring the responsibility for calling it a spade to the district attorney. Sometimes, naturally, he was apt to apply the offensive designation of spade to something which was a mere trowel, and the local news probably lost in impartiality what it gained in piquancy. The editorial page was more opinionated and more violent in the expression of opinion than civilized editorial pages today. But allowing for the different manners of the time, it can hardly be doubted that however primitive the newspapermen of that time may have been, they had a keen scent for news. An example from the early history of the times. In September 1854, the steamer Arctic was sunk in a collision in the North Atlantic with a loss of several hundred lives. Rumors of the disaster had been prevalent for several days after the steamer's failure to arrive had excited apprehension. But not until the night of October 10th did these rumors become precise. Even then, nobody could find responsible authority for the report that the Arctic had been sunk, and the night city editor of the Times, having put the paper to bed, climbed on a horse car to go home in the early morning hours, thinking that nothing more could be done. By one of those pieces of good luck which do happen to newspaper men more often than a skeptical world believes, though not so often as the harassed reporter could desire, the editor's attention was attracted to a befuddled passenger on the horse car who was attempting to tell the conductor all about the terrible disaster at sea. The conductor, no doubt, was not so attentive as could be desired nor was the narrator entirely clear in thought and speech. The editor did his best, but could overhear only a few disjoined phrases, among which were Harold and Bottle of Wine. The first of these told him where the news had gone, and the second 
warned him that the prudent Herald staff had done what they could do to make it impossible for anyone else to get a coherent story from their informant. But there was another way out. The editor hurried back to the Times building and had the presses stopped. The Herald was already on the press, beyond doubt, and a man from the Times press room, in whose ability to do difficult things everybody seems to have had confidence, was told to go to the Herald building and get the first copy printed. He returned presently and reported that the Herald press room was locked up and that the carriers who ordinarily distributed the paper before daylight had been shut out. The Herald, having a big exclusive story, had sent out its mail circulation, but had determined to hold up the papers for the city until an hour after all its competitors were in the hands of their readers, when the appearance of the Herald with this huge beat would be the more impressive. The pressman was promised $50 if he could get a copy of the Herald in spite of these obstacles, and by means not recorded by the ancient chroniclers, he did it. And there was the full story of the Arctic disaster by the first returning survivor, George H. Burns. The Times composing room staff was hastily reassembled. No doubt some of them were found in nearby and easily accessible gathering places, such as the vigilance of Mr. Volstead has now abolished. And the Herald's story was reset and injected into the first page of the Times. The Times City edition was circulated at the usual time the next morning, and, no doubt, when the Herald appeared an hour later, many worthy citizens thought with contempt that it had merely lifted Burns's story from the Times. The next day a number of survivors arrived, and Raymond himself turned reporter and put himself under the city editor's orders for a task which, considering the limited facilities of the day, was about as hard as that which the Times staff confronted after the Titanic was sunk, and which was met as successfully. Maverick, in recording this episode, appears to think it necessary to forestall criticism by saying that, of course, Burns had undoubtedly given his story to the Herald in the supposition that it would at once be communicated to all the other papers, and that, in lifting it, the Times was merely carrying out his wishes and thwarting an iniquitous competitor. Maybe so. At any rate, the Night City editor was raised $5 a week, which was quite a lot of money in those days. The front page of a New York newspaper in the 50s was usually devoted, for the most part, either to telegraphic news of the doings of Congress and the administration, or to European news of which a much larger amount was printed in proportion to the size of the paper, than was dreamed of in recent years until the war. In August 1858, New York was in a frenzy of excitement over the successful laying of the first Atlantic cable, but that fragile connection survived barely long enough to endure some polite interchange of felicitations between Queen Victoria and President Buchanan, and then became unworkable. Not till almost a decade later was permanent cable communication established, and even in the Franco-Prussian War, cable news consisted of little but a collection of brief official dispatches and announcements, with most of the news conveyed by mail. In the 50s, it all came by mail and an ingenious and elaborate technique had been evolved to get it as quickly as possible. Correspondents of papers and news associations in Europe sent their letters, their digests of current happenings, and the latest English or French papers by the last mail to the transatlantic steamers, which were met off Cape Race by pilot boats which took off the news dispatches. These were then taken ashore and telegraphed to New York when this was possible. Usually only the briefest skeleton of the latest news could be sent by wire, and the bulk of it had to come by train. More than once, the Times' dispatches during the war in Italy in 1859 were published in a fragmentary condition, 
with the explanation that a telegraph operator at some relay point between New York and the Nova Scotian coast had closed his office and gone home for the night, leaving news dispatches to wait until tomorrow. The news thus arriving would be headed somewhat as follows, quote, three days later from Europe, arrival of the city of Paris, the new English cabinet, unquote, and so on. Other overseas mail correspondence to which much space was given was the news from California, where men who had gone to dig wealth from the ground were preparing the way for a race which should develop new possibilities in the exercise of the free imagination, and from Central America, where William Walker and his associates were valiantly trying to repeat the exploits of Pizarro and Cortez and create the golden circle which would compensate the slave states for the prospective loss of control of the federal government. On the second and third pages were book reviews and general articles something like those now appearing in newspaper magazine sections. The fourth page, editorial, began with a summary of the day's news and usually included dramatic and musical news and critiques besides leading articles. Very late telegraphic news was often put on the editorial page or the page opposite. Local news and advertisements occupied much of the fifth, sixth, and seventh pages, and the last page was devoted chiefly to financial and commercial news and advertising. This is, of course, a generalized description, and any given issue of any paper might depart considerably from the type but substantially this seems to have been the idea of a good newspaper in the 50s. And allowing for the handicaps imposed by the immature mechanical development of the time, it is a pretty good newspaper even yet. Raymond is credited with the invention of the display headline in 1856, but ideas of display were more modest in those days and found sufficient exercise within the limits of a single column. Even in the Civil War, single column heads sufficed. The Times on April 4, 1865, for example, told of the capture of the Confederate capital under a single column head as follows, Grant, Richmond, and Victory. This was in the first of the six columns, in the last was the story of the effect of the news in New York, of course with its own head, and the four columns between were filled in with a cut of the American eagle, somewhat precariously grasping his thunderbolts, his olive branch, and Richmond all at the same time. Lee's surrender was displayed with a single column head, and so was Lincoln's death, which the Times, for the guidance of its readers, described in the top line of the head as an awful event. On great occasions, the telegraph editor sometimes found it desirable to attract attention by beginning his head with the admonitory line, highly important news, but not till the days of the Tweed Ring, when the Times had the biggest local exclusive story that had ever come to a New York paper did the headlines go beyond a single column. However, display headlines, and even descriptive headlines, are an acquired taste, as is evident from the fact that most of the world outside the United States still gets along without them. The newspapers of the 50s afforded little consolation to those who want to read the headlines because they lack the time or the intelligence to read the news. They were published for people who had time to spend on finding out what was going on. It may be that our generation prefers to read the headline, Manning, Elevated to Bishop, Voices Curb on Radicalism, to select a recent example, not from the Times, rather than look into the article in the hope of finding out exactly to what, and in what sense, Dr. Manning was elevated, and just how a curb may be voiced. Perhaps this preference is natural and inevitable, an outgrowth of the spirit of the time, whatever that is. If so, as Henry Adams said about life, 
one may accept it without feeling the necessity of pretending to admire it. The Times was never, with the conspicuous exception of its campaign against Tweed, a crusading paper. It has on occasion done its share in exposing conditions that needed correction, but it does not select this one out of many activities of a good newspaper as a life work. It crusaded occasionally and mildly in the 50s, but after the time of Kashut, it never lost its balance. In 1856, for example, it gave a good deal of attention to the condition of the streets and seemed much encouraged when public indignation was aroused and an attempt was made to compel the city government to give back a little service in return for unlimited opportunity of peculation. They had much to learn in the 50s. Not for 40 years were New York streets to be measurably improved, and the art of snow removal is far from perfection even yet. In 1857, James W. Simonton, then Washington correspondent of the Times, exposed a magnificent scheme of land-stealing and corruption in connection with the extension of railroads into Minnesota. The affair seems to have been conducted in the grand manner, very much as the similar enterprise described in the Gilded Age. The House of Representatives was outraged in its finest sensibilities by Simonton's charges that four of its members were corruptly involved, and he was summoned before a congressional committee for proper rebuke. By the time the committee had finished with Simonton, it had been compelled to admit that he was telling the truth and to recommend that the four guilty men be expelled. Soon after Simonton was sent across the plains with General Albert Sidney Johnston's expeditionary force against the Mormons, to the regret perhaps of certain persons, among them newspaper editors eager to show how ably they could cover a war, Brigham Young came down as promptly as Davy Crockett's coon. Simonton went on to California and was lost to the times. But another and greater war was on hand, and the times added greatly to its prestige by its efficiency in giving the news of the war in Italy in 1859. Raymond covered that war himself, ably assisted by his Paris correspondent, Dr. W. E. Johnston who, following a custom prevalent then and till much later, wrote over the pen name of Malakoff. The most brilliant incident of Raymond's career as a war correspondent was his eyewitness account of the Battle of Soferino, perhaps the best of many admirable pictures of the war which the Times published. Soferino displayed not only Raymond's ability as a writer, but his talent as a news editor. In those days, the press of the world was divided into two classes. In class one, alone and unapproachable, stood the London Times. The other newspapers of Europe and America differed only in their degree of inferiority, at least in the public estimation. A London Times correspondent was, of course, at Solferino, apparently as essential a part of the battle as the three sovereigns who honored it with their personal attention. And Raymond knew that when the London Times, with this man's account, reached New York, every editor would feel that the definitive and decisive story had arrived. Raymond decided not only to have as good a story as the London Times, but to beat it to New York, a feat which, of course, would have to be accomplished by mail. Through Malakoff's influence, Raymond's dispatch, written among the wounded in Castiglione while the guns still sounded a few miles away, was taken to Paris with Napoleon's own dispatches by a French military messenger and given to Mrs. Raymond, then at a Paris hotel. With it were directions from her husband to put it on the first steamer, leaving either England or France for New York. Mrs. Raymond seems to have been a pretty good reporter herself in emergencies. Thirty hours later, she put her husband's dispatch on the Liverpool mailboat with her own hands. At that moment, the London Times, 
whose story had come up from Italy by the same messenger, was just appearing on the streets in London, but it missed the New York mail and arrived ten days after Raymond's account of the battle had been published. Solferino may serve as an illustration of the slowness with which European news reached New York in those days before the cable. The battle was fought on the 24th of June. On July 7th, under the heading, The War in Italy, Advices, three days later, the Times published the batch of news brought on a steamer leaving Ireland on June 26th. The beginning of the two columns of news announced that the steamer had been boarded off Cape Race by the news yacht of the Associated Press, which took off the synopsis of news prepared by our Liverpool agent. This reached St. John's, Newfoundland, on July 4, and managed to get to New York by telegraph on the 6th. Our Liverpool agent synopsis closed on June 23rd and consisted mainly of official announcements in Vienna and Paris that a battle might be fought, would be fought, but had not yet been fought. Down below all this, an inch or two above the bottom of the column, appeared a modest item dated in Paris on June 25th and headed, The Very Latest by Telegraph to Galway. It contained Napoleon's dispatch to Eugenie, announcing the decisive victory at Solferino. This dispatch, of course, had been mentioned in the headline, three or four banks below the top, and it was handled editorially with a due sense of its importance. The leading article was an admirable analysis of the campaign and drew from very scanty material inferences fully justified by the event. But the custom of printing the news first received at the top of the column and letting the later dispatches follow in chronological order had a strong hold on newspaper tradition. Not till the 70s did it occur to some enterprising journalist that it might be a good idea to put the latest or most important news at the head of the column. The next mailboat brought Raymond's and Malakoff's dispatches, which the Times published on July 12th, again with the first dispatch first and the story of Solferino trailing along toward the end. The Times that day gave up two of its eight pages to news and correspondence from the war. As early as 1852, it had devoted seven of its 24 columns to the news of the final day in the famous Whig convention at Baltimore, and this without any undue prominence for Raymond. And in 1856, nine columns of the 48, including the whole front page, were one morning given up to the publication of the full text of correspondence in a diplomatic dispute with England. Whether these displays were disproportionate is a matter of taste. Raymond's feats, however, were not the only source of distinction for the times in the Italian war. Quite as much attention was aroused by an exploit on the internal front, which tradition ascribes to William Henry Hurlbert, whom Raymond had left in charge of the editorial page. On the morning of July 15, 1859, this gentleman was one of a party who saw a friend off on a steamer. The party spent an enjoyable morning, and then Hurlbert went to the office to write an editorial about the Quadrilateral, the famous Austrian fortress group to which the armies of Francis Joseph retired after the defeat at Solferino. Apparently his mind wandered from time to time, now to the cabinet crisis in England, now to the new fortifications of Paris, and now to the social morning just ended. The result appeared on the Times editorial page the next morning under the heading, The Defensive Square of Austrian Italy. Future sociologists of this well-prohibited republic are commended to a study of this article. The Times proofroom was then regarded as the best in New York, but a few days before that a proofreader had ventured to change a word in one of Hurlbert's editorials, and had been ordered, with much indignation, never to do so again. 
He read this article on the quadrilateral and found therein such expressions as the following, quote, If we shall follow the windings of the mincio, we shall find countless elbows formed in the elbows of the regular army. If we follow up the course of the mincio, we shall find innumerable elbows formed by the sympathy of youth. Notwithstanding the toil spent by Austria on the spot, we should have learned that we are protected by a foreign fleet suddenly coming up on our question of citizenship. A canal cuts Mantua in two, but we may rely on the most cordial cabinet minister of the new power in England. The Adige is deep and swift at Verona. Paris is strong in her circle of fortifications, unquote. along with much else which was plausible and often accurate. Whereupon the proofreader remembered that he had been forbidden to touch a word of Hurlbert's copy, and the article was printed as written. Next day it was reprinted, as it ought to have been written, with an apologetic note that, by a confusion of manuscripts sent up at a late hour, the regrettable error had occurred, which, the Times admitted, had furnished a happy occasion for airing a little envy, malice, and uncharitableness to the less respectable among the daily journals. A friend of Raymond's reports that when he read this article in Paris, weeks later, he denounced it, as was natural enough, but did not disavow it. This generosity is praiseworthy, but it would have been rather late for a disavowal by that time. So, by the opening of the Civil War, the New York Times, the daily had been dropped from the title in 1857, had already won itself a place as one of the great papers of America. Also, it had prospered. As early as 1855, it claimed the honor of being second only to the Herald in circulation, and by the end of its first decade, nobody in the Times office would admit that it had any superior. The original quarters were long since outgrown. As early as 1854, the Times had begun to think of moving, but when plans for a new home became more definite, the paper had reached such a degree of prosperity that it was possible to build on a more magnificent scale than could have been hoped a few years earlier. The first Times building, first, that is, of those which the paper built for itself, into which the paper entered on May 1, 1858, occupied the triangle between Park Row and Nassau and Beekman Streets, on the spot where the second Times building, erected in 1888, still stands. The growth of the paper in recent years led to the erection of the Times building in Times Square, and then of the Times Annex in West 43rd Street, which already is uncomfortably small. And each of the four homes of the Times has, in its turn, been the finest newspaper building in the country. The structure, which seemed so magnificent in the 50s, would of course be somewhat commonplace today, but in its time it was far superior to anything ever built for the accommodation of an American newspaper. For its erection, a 60% assessment was levied on the stock, and all profits above 20% a year were set aside for the time being for a building fund. The Times was making money enough money to justify its owners in what then seemed to some of their contemporaries a rather hazardous investment in unnecessary luxury. The five stories of the Times building rose to the dizzy height of 80 feet above City Hall Park, and from the windows of the top floor, as Maverick wrote, the upper part of New York is spread out before the eye in one grand panoramic view. End of section two and of chapter one of part one.